uh, sign up today. All right? All good? Yeah. Turn to your neighbor and say, let's get ready for the word of God. Why don't we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, we thank you for today as we gather. Father, we just want to believe, oh God. Your Holy Spirit is in, uh, within us, among us, in us. God, do the work of transformation. Father, if some of our hearts here are hardened because of the situation of our life, because of the circumstances of our life, Holy Spirit, we just pray, would you just moisten our heart right now, that you will do the work in our hearts that only you can. God, I pray we want to hear your words and not the words of men this morning. Thank you, Jesus. We commit everything to your hand in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 You know, my theme for 2023, the one word that I've been praying every year, um, you know, I always pray for a word. And then for the remaining of the year, I will live my life based on that word. The word for my life this year is simplicity. That means just keep it simple, don't need to complicate stuff. You know, a lot of times, a lot of problems in life are self-inflicted. You know, uh, we complex things up, we mess things up. It's just because, you know, we just complicate things too much. So, one other thing I recently got to know was, I mean, in the past few weeks was, I began to go back into passages in the Bible that I thought I knew very well. You know, and then uh, I began to read through that again. Just like, for example, you know, one of the things that is very famous during Christmas, uh, I'm not sure if you, if you go to the Sunday school like me, there will be this scene where, you know, Joseph and Mary with a big, you know, belly and trying to knock every hotel, there was no room for them. You know? But, 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 but there was no such case in the Bible. You know? So the Bible doesn't say there's no guest house for them. You know, so I begin to go back into different, different chapters and begin to read and to get an understanding again. Now, one of the, the story that I went back was, the story of David and Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Okay? Um, it's a very famous story. In fact, non-Christians even know the story of David and Goliath. Right? I mean, if you go to, if you go to a, a business meeting, you know, for example, your, 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 your small little company maybe is going to uh, compete with a multinational company. Oh, this is the tale of David and Goliath. You know? But actually you know perhaps there's something within the context of the story that we may have missed out so today i know i just want to go back into first samuel 17 just the first part of the story and then we will get to know more about that uh, that story and see and allow god to speak to us so today if you have had any preconceptions that you have been keeping in your mind why don't today start with a clean slate and allow god to speak to you all right the title of my message today is ready set giant Okay, ready, set, giant. Now let's look into 1 Samuel 17, verse 1 to 3. Okay, 1 Samuel 17, verse 1 to 3. Okay, there we go. Um, now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at Sokor, which belonged to Judah. They encamped between Sokar and Ezekah in Ephas Damim. And Saul, the men of Israel, were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on mountain on one side, and Israel stood on mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. Now, so let me paint a picture. So, the Israelites on one side, on a mountain, the Philistines on another side, there's a valley between them. They were standing and ready in position for war. Okay, now let's move on in verse 8. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel to them. This was Goliath. Okay. Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and servers. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Verse 11, it says, When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, this was literally after they camped both sides, setting up their base on two mountains with a valley between them. Goliath you know, the seven foot, eight foot guy came out and said, Hey, why don't we do this? Send one guy, fight, and I fight with you. 
whoever wins, we will serve. The loser will serve the winner. No, when I was reading this, I thought, man, if this is the case, how every war in the world is fought today, perhaps you know most of the war will have ended very quickly. We sent all the presidents of the country to do a one-on-one -on -one duel. <laughs> you know, so, but that that was what Goliath wanted to do. He was challenging the people of Israelites. The army of Israelites said, send one guy, let's fight. Let's fight. Now, if you were to notice this, Goliath was literally, what he was doing was he was inflicting fear on the people. Because there was never before the Israelites saw a man with such a huge physique. Huge. He was... He was very tall and all that stuff. So the Israelites standing before Goliath, the Bible says in verse 11, they were struck with fear. And even Saul was struck with fear as well. You know what? In the history of Israel up to that time, there was only one other guy who was tall and standing high and tall, head and shoulder above the rest. Who was it? Saul. Exactly, that's right. If you were to look back in 1 Samuel 10, 23, when they cried out to Samuel, God, give us a king. We don't want the prophet to lead our us anymore. All other nations have king. We want a king for ourselves. And when, when, and when Samuel actually gathered the people in 1 Samuel 10, 23, the Bible said this, so they ran and brought him Saul from there. And when he had stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. That means everyone else was below Saul's shoulder. But unfortunately today, there was another guy with better physique than their king. I don't know about you. There are sometimes maybe you think that guy is your role model and, and in the world it's like that. That guy is my role model because he has done this, he has achieved this, he is, he is this tall. But now, the enemy comes and presents himself with another better person, another scarier person. Even Saul himself, who are probably the tallest in Israel, is afraid. And they ran. And I was thinking, why was Saul afraid? Because in 1 Samuel chapter 16, one verse before this, the Bible says the Spirit of God has left Saul. And David has to play the harp. Remember? And a lot of time it is like that. So often when we are fearful, we have to ask ourselves a question. Is the Spirit of God still within us? Or is it just like Saul? You know, a lot of time, fear is, not, is more than just an emotion. emotion. It is a spiritual condition. It is a mirror that reflects our condition with God. When the Israelites saw Goliath, they actually saw their fear personified. It wasn't the... It wasn't, I mean, of course, yes, Goliath was huge and it's scary. But what was real to them was their fear. Was it Goliath they feared? Or was it their lack of faith in God's power? If, you would, if I were to ask you this question today, what are you fearful today? Arthur came out and prayed for breakthroughs, healings, and all that stuff. There are areas in our life we always want to break through. There are, there are areas in our life that we are fearful about. But if you were to really think about what you are fearing about, was it that giant that you are fearful of? Or was it the reality is that we have lack of faith in the power of God in our life? Only you will understand that question. Fear can cripple us. It makes us forget of God's past faithfulness and blindness to the ability to deliver us in the present. And, and, and that's why it's, it's disheartening in verse 11. It says, When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now what happened in verse 11 is interesting. Goliath was basically intimidating them with their words and with his physique looks. You know, he was smart. You know, the enemy is always on this strategy. If you could just attack someone without lifting your hands by instilling fear, then that's it. The battle is won. You know, a lot of times it's like that. We are fearful over something that has not even happened yet. We just heard of it. For example, oh, 
China is having this pneumonia again? Are we going to go into lockdown next year? We heard. And what we heard has the ability to cripple us. What we heard has the ability to, to just cause us not to do anything. You know, Goliath was smart. He chose to attack every individual because every individual, when the seed of fear gets rooted in them, the entire community, the entire army will be easily discouraged. Fear seeks to paralyze. It is the silent thief of progress freezing our steps before the battle even begins. I just thought maybe this is the last month of 2023 before we step into 2024. Let us confront our fear. Perhaps you've been hearing. Perhaps you've been reading. Perhaps you've been wondering for all those fears that have never really happened in reality. And he has paralyzed you. It has paralyzed. Sometimes it paralyzes us to an extent that we don't even dare to pray about it anymore. You know, we were organizing the, 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 uh, the parenting seminar on the 13th of January. You know, we were talking for a while. The date was set. The speaker booked his flights and everything. And lo and behold, just last week, PBA, Perbantanan Bekalan Ayeh Pulau Pinang, I think, something like that. Right, our waterworks in Penang. They announced from the 10th to the 14th of January there will be an island-wide, statewide water disruption. I was like, man, what is this? Every time. But it hasn't happened yet. You know, I've told a few of our team, so let us pray. Let us pray that in God's speed they can change the pipe within a day and everything will be done. Can we do that? What are you fearful about? What has Realize your fear that you don't even dare to move. You don't even dare to pray anymore. Now in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 16, the Bible said this, And the Philistine, Goliath, drew near and presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. So you saw what happened? So basically, they are lining up on one mountain on one side with a valley between them. So Goliath, basically, every day for 40 days, he will come down to the valley, look at the Israelites' army, and shout to them, come on, send one person, let's fight. For 40 days. And he will say all that mocking words and everything, and then after that, he will go back to his camp. For 40 days, the Israelites' army heard that same words, saw the same guy, taunt them, mock them, but they did not do anything. Church, perhaps it's time for us to get up. We need to stop to allow the fear to paralyze us. We need to rise in faith. If 2023 has been the year you've been wondering, should I do this or not? Should I serve or not? Should I step out from the boat or not? Perhaps it has been 40 days you have been allowing the enemy to come to your doorstep, knock on your door and say, hey, you can't do it. When are you going to come out? For 40 days, they just stood there. I, I feel today God is just calling some of us here. You've been waiting for too long. You've been waiting in passivity for too long. You know what? When Pe- it's only the moment when Peter stepped out from the boat, he walked on water. Even though it was only for a few steps. But he did. You need to speak to your fear how big God is. Amen? Amen? Now let's move on. So they were there for 40 days. The Israelites' army, they did not dare to do anything. It was all down to their perception and perspective. All they saw was Goliath was huge. He's scary. No, 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 it's not good. I mean, it won't be good for us if we were to go down to the valley and fight them. Now let's read what the Bible says in 1 Samuel 17 verse 23. Now, this was the time when the Bible began to introduce David into the picture. David was sent by his father Jesse to go to the battleground to find out how his three brothers were doing. Now, just to give you a bit of context, based on the book of Numbers, um, I think there's a verse that said, if you are 20 years old and above, it is compulsory for you to serve as an army in Israel. Okay? So we can roughly conclude that David was a teenager then. I mean, the oldest is probably 19. He's still a teen. 
Okay, so he was with Jesse, his father, tending sheep, and his father actually sent him to the battlefield to find out what he was doing. So here comes David. It's like a change of scene. The main character comes in. Now let's read 1 Samuel 17, 23, 27. Then, as he talked to them, David was talking to the soldiers of Israel and his brothers. There was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistine, and he spoke according to the same words, the same thing he has been saying for the past 40 days. So David heard them, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. They were still afraid, even after 40 days. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? They asked David, Have you seen him? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and it shall be that man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter, and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Wow, the interesting thing was this. They were afraid, but they knew the reward they would get if they defeat them. I thought, man, if I don't have to pay tax for the rest of my life, and I, became, and I become Saul's son-in-law, that's pretty good. I will give it a try. They were fearful, but they know the reward. But the sad thing was they wasn't doing anything. Sometimes you know your condition. You were fearful to step out. But sometimes you also know that if you were to overcome that fear and step out and rise in faith, you will know what will happen to you. It's like you will know that God will bless you and all that thing that you've been wanting for, praying for, breakthrough may happen. But yet you still choose not to do anything. Look at what David said. Then David spoke to the man who stood by him saying, What shall be done for the man who killed this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? From who as this, is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in this manner, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Now David here, he comes here with a different perspective. He said who should, that he should defy the armies of the living God. He, don't, he doesn't just see this as an army of Israel, but he sees that they are the armies of God. They are the people of God. David, a young shepherd with a different perspective, came in, he saw a different thing. But the soldiers who were trained saw a giant. But David saw a defiant enemy of God. You know what? A lot of times, church, the contrast in perception is very striking. It wasn't about the physicality of the battle itself, but it was about the spiritual implications. You know, you, you, can, you and I could probably see the same thing, but perhaps I could only say the surface of the problem. Or maybe pastor can say, hey, no, this is, I said, this is not this issue. This is a spiritual issue. David understood the implication of the matter spiritually. But a lot of time, and that's why the Bible says we do not war against the flesh and blood, but the principalities and the, flesh and, and, the, and the powers of darkness. So David totally understood this. David's perspective was totally rooted in his faith that he didn't see Goliath through the lens of fear, but through, his, but through the faith in God's sovereignty and power. That faith gave him a different vision where giants are not obstacles, but an opportunity. Church, I'm not asking you to try your best. I'm not asking you to go to all the self-help section in the book, be the better version of yourself. No, I'm asking all of us, if you can, if we can, we need to rise up in faith, just like David did. Just like David did. It is not about us, but our faith in God. We sang this whole morning. God is our only foundation. And if we were to really live our life with faith on that, man, every obstacle will be an opportunity for us. It will be an opportunity for God's glory to be displayed. This is a call to shift our perspective. Before we step into 2024, as we wrap up 2023, Perhaps there's a perspective that we need to alter. What are you seeing today that God is telling you you need a new perspective? What is it?
what is it? Our perspective on life's challenges reflects our understanding of God's nature and power. All the challenges that we go through in life, how we view them often tells us our understanding of God's nature and His power. If, if you have an exam coming, SPM, I think SPM is starting right already in, in the midst of that. I know it's difficult. You know, we've been through that. But if you look at that and you think, oh, maybe I should just fake MC and not going, you know, get a COVID, you know, five days rest at home. <laughs> You're missing the point. One of the best ways to evaluate this is to evaluate your perspective on your life challenge. Because that will indirectly tell you your understanding of God's nature and God's power in your life. Perhaps we need to repent from that. Perhaps at certain times we are too paralyzed, being struck by the fear of the things that's around us, that we, we have belittled God to this small little thing and we just keep it in our pocket. Maybe God, when we settle all these things, only you come back up again. Church, we need, we need a new perspective. To the armies of Israel, Goliath was more real to them than God. But to David, God was his ultimate reality. Overshadow even the most intimidating of their earthly challenges. If fear has been your reality, today I pray, maybe you should ask God, God, I pray for the reality of a kingdom to come into my life again so that I get a new perspective to do that. One of the things I recently did after MCO was this. Um, at the end of every year, I will go to a different place, me and my wife, and we will just... I know people do silent retreat. They just keep quiet and they hear from God. Uh, all good. You do whatever that works for you. Uh, but one of the things that I've been doing is I call it my perspective trip. Okay, so uh, so this year I went to Singapore twice to talk to five different people, uh, three Christians, two non-believers. Uh, they are in the two non-believers are more in different industry. I need to know in work what's trending and stuff like that. And the reason why I do this is because I need to find my blind spots. Because there are only certain things that people can tell me from what they see outside. And, and you know what? It's very interesting. Of the three Christians, all from different church background, a Methodist background, charismatic background, another guy go to a, a campus church, okay? And two non-believers. The amazing thing that all these five persons said to, to me in the conversation in, in October was this. I need to look out. Man, I was like, God, are you using a non-believer to even tell me that I need to look outside, not just within the walls of the church? And, and, and this is framing, you know, what I want to do for 2024, whether it's my life, my ministry, everything. So I want to encourage you, you know, when someone tells you something, give you a bit of perspective, don't be too agitated. I know it's not comfortable to hear. It is definitely not comfortable to hear. But they are all good for your, for your life. Okay? All right? Now, we move on. First Samuel 17, 28 to 30. So David came. Goliath came taunting them again. They make a big fuss. Now, in First Samuel 17, 28, something happened before David actually met Goliath. Now, Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the man. So Eliab was his oldest brother who's in the army. When he heard what David spoke with the man about, you know, what's the reward, what are, what, what are all the things, Eliab's anger was aroused against David and he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. You know, basically in Chinese saying, it's just like, turn it now, but you can only hear what you want to do. You want to see the battle. You want to see how we fight. What are you doing here? Verse 29. And David said, What have I done now? Is there not a cause? 
Then he turned from him toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. Well, he had three brothers who were there fighting. So within the brothers, they were talking, talking, and talking. And they were, David was literally getting rebuked for going there to Capo. You know? And that talk of something, sometimes in the midst of the calling of God, or something that God has called us, we will have brothers that stand in our way. Ouch. In the midst of taunts and discouragement from his brothers, David stood resolute. He said, is there not a cause? I mean, you think about it. For 40 days, Goliath has been there, taunting them, mocking them, and now they're having their own World War I, World War II, internal World War. And the best part is this. David told them, is there not a cause? David knew the cause that he stood for, the cause that he was passionate for. And he knew this. He knew that the argument with his brothers was not the battle for him. Goliath was the right battle. So often, we got stuck in fighting the wrong battle. We need to fight the right battle, but to do that, we need to understand our cause, just like David did. There is no way. There is no way otherwise we would just do all the things and realize that, hey, this was not the purpose that God has meant for us in the beginning. Don't fight the wrong battle. Don't fight the wrong battle. You know, often we can be so embroiled in internal conflicts or some issues within the church that we lose sight of the greater mission outside to engage with the world, to preach the good news just as Jesus has commissioned. I don't know about you, growing up as a Christian in church, I've seen a fair share of all those things. And it pains, and sometimes I tell you to, to really sort all those internal conflicts and issues, it drains so much energy. But at the end of it, you are totally tired and you don't have energy left to go out. But you know what God, Jesus said what? Go! Go out! Preach the gospel. Bring the good news to the world. And it's interesting. The Bible said that David asked, is there not a cause? You know, it's always the internal that always needs a reminder on the cause. David will never go to Goliath. Is there not a cause that we are fighting here? He knew. Goliath doesn't need to be reminded. He, didn't, he wasn't part of that cause anyway. But the Israelites, they need a reminder. Is there not a cause? Why are we here for? Why are we bickering? Why are we arguing? You know, that's, I, 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 and that is one, one of the conversations I had with Pastor. I said, I told Pastor this. I said, Pastor, me and JJ, we, we have this conviction. Whatever that we do in life must always have two perspectives in church next year. We want to serve the community inside church and we want to go and reach the people outside church. So, church, I, can I just encourage you if you were just to have this perspective? moving into 2024, I can guarantee you life will be very different in 2024. You will come to church feeling fulfilled because coming to church is a time where we equip one another, where we share our stories with one another, when we share our struggles. You know what? I tried to pray for this person who was sick. You know, he didn't get it. You know, is there any way I can help this person? Because we will be coming in with our stories. We will be coming in with all those different things about how we can engage and reach the world for Jesus. And when we do that, we thrive here and people want to come to City Light because the love of God is so evident here. But at the same time, we are doing all all that we can to bring the love of God outside to wherever God has placed us, to wherever, which apartment, which condo, which workplace, which college, which school that God has placed us in and we shine the light for Jesus. And I pray today, before the year ends, we get reminded of our cause again. That is really important. While it's easy to get caught up in internal disagreements and become comfortable in our church community, we have always, always have to remember that our calling is broader. David saw beyond the immediate disapproval of his brothers and recognized that the real battle, a spiritual battle, is the one that is with Goliath, the one that impacted the honor of God and his people. There was this quote that says this, our greatest fear should not be of failure, 
but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. By D.L. Moody. I pray today you have a shift in your perspective and you begin to pick the right battles to fight. So often Satan is there, the enemy is there to distract us. And maybe you should do this. But at the end of the day, only we realize we fought the wrong battle. But there's one question I want to bring a twist to you. You know, we all, when we always read this question, read this chapter, we always, we always start to identify. Okay, so is there an Eliab in our circle of friends? Is there an Eliab who tell us or discourage us? You know, when, when, as usual, every time when we read these chapters, this passage of the scripture, we always do this. We start to identify. Hmm, maybe Arthur is the one who often discouraged me. And when I go to church, you know, maybe, uh, maybe some Liverpool fan will taunt me, you know, yeah, you all lost 3-0 again last night, right? And that kind of stuff. You know, we always think who are Eliab's to us. But today, can, I, can, I, can, we, can we just swing right to the opposite extreme? Perhaps, were that time in our lives, have we been Eliab to somebody? I'm serious. As I read this, God was speaking to me exactly like that. You know, Isaac, you've always been thinking who are the... Every time when you read this, you always identify who are your Eliabs. But can you identify when were there situations when you have been Eliab to other people? There were. I, I, I'm going to tell you honestly, yes, there were. There were times I have been Eliab to people. I have been pouring cold water. I have been discouraging them. I'm saying... Maybe we... Maybe today, if you have been Eliab to someone... Go to that same person, encourage him. Encourage him. Amen? Amen? Let's move on to verse 31. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul and he sent for him. It's interesting, isn't it? They were there in the camp, listening to Goliath, and they were having a mini war war among themselves. Mini war among themselves. And what they spoke actually went all the way right up to the king. So you don't, don't actually think that, you know, I, I just want to tell you, just, just jokingly, a lot of times maybe the conversation you said in church, I think pastors sometimes know one. Scared, right? No, 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 no. He, he doesn't plant spice and everything, but maybe God tells him. You know, but it's interesting, but Saul knew what they said because it went all the way up. I, I thought maybe nothing was happening, the 40 days was pretty boring, and the conversation went up. Now look at this. Saul asked for David. Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Let no man's heart fail because of him. David took on, assumed this responsibility. He says, No, let not man's hearts fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. Now, this is the part where we talk about preparedness and God's empowerment. When David volunteered to fight Goliath, many were skeptical. After all, he was just a young shepherd. Remember what Eliab said? You and your few shepherds, why you come here? We are often judged by our experience and our capability. Saul was technically saying to David, Hey bro, you are just a youth, teenager. But this guy, a man of war, since his youth. This is one thing that we must dig deep and reflect. You know, when he said this, it, it, it sort of hit me because we, we, we are a youth church. We are, have been talking about to raise and reach out to the next generation. Right? We shouldn't speak like, like, like Saul. So often we say, hey, you don't have experience. Of course what? Teenagers, we have experience from war. Right? Exactly, but this was exact same thing that Paul said to Timothy. Let no one despise your youth. But be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. That means God is not using you because you are young. But in spite of your youth, but you are still being a good example in word, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. And that is the reason why God can still use a youth if you will live right with God. 
And David did all that. So in God's narrative, the unlikeliest heroes like David arise not from the ranks of the experience, but from the corners of faith and obedience. And, and sometimes I do think that too. You know, as we get older, we consider more risk factors. When we were younger, pastor asked us to do it. Can I? Let's do it. We don't think so much. We don't think, oh, what if tomorrow no money? Because I know my parents will buy all the things I needed. You know, let us have that kind of passion again. Let us be able to do that. To rise from the corners of faith and obedience. And what David said to Saul, he said to Saul this in verse 34, he said, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or bear came and took a lamb of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. When it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Now when I read this, I was thought, wow. So David was trying to justify his CV to Saul. Hey, you say I have no experience, but I, fight, I fought bears and I fought lions while I was taking care of the sheep. Then I began to think, hey, kind of pride, isn't it? Like, yeah, it's a different beast. No, but I fought all those beasts in the, uh, on the field. But I'm glad David said this. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Now, if you were to realize this, so often we will go back to the experience we'll tell, like David to sell, tell Saul, hey, you know, I've done this before in this church, that church. I've served as a worship leader here and there, and I've done this, all, this kind of thing, all this kind of stuff. But you know what David did? David acknowledged all the experience. But the one thing, one additional thing that he acknowledged was this, that, all, that in all those experiences, it was God who gave him the victory. He gave the glory back to God, even though he experienced all that kind of stuff. David's preparedness was of a different kind. His experience were not just physical encounters with the lions and bears. His experience were his spiritual lessons in trusting God. Today, perhaps, some of you are fighting your bears and lion. Just like David did. But you must learn to trust God when you fight the, 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 the lions and the bears. Because if you don't trust God when you are fighting the lions and the bears, you cannot be trusting God. It will be harder for you to trust in God when you are fighting a Goliath. Do, do you get what I mean? It's the same thing with tithe. If today, if you're only making 500 ringgit a month, you can't even give a tithe of what? 50 ringgit? One day when you have 500 million, it will be hard really difficult for you to give 50 million as tithe. It all starts somewhere. Today, perhaps the small little lion and bears that you are fighting your life, it's God's opportunity for us. Hey, lean on me. Hey, trust me. I, I don't know if you notice, but John 15 has been ringing at almost every week for the past six weeks in our church. Every speaker who came up here, you know, abide in Jesus. For up beside me, you cannot bear fruit. Uh, for the past six weeks, you, you, you go and listen back. You know, every preacher who preached from here has been preaching from this context. I, I don't know if God is wanting to tell us this. Abide in me. In your lions and in your bears. Trust me. Because if we can trust God on this small stuff, that when we finally meet our giant, we are ready. And David's story is a testament to God's empowerment. Every lion and every bear we face prepare us for our Goliath, teaching us not to trust in our sling, but in God's might. So often we, we take it so wrongly that, I mean, if I'm David, I could say, hey, it's my sling one. I was the one to, who learned how to use my sling perfectly to hit the bear. No, no, but it was not a tool. It was not even an experience account. They were great. But it was God. 
It was the obedience and trust in God that made the difference in David's life. And he recognized it when he was still a teenager. You know, that was the beautiful thing. The trust is not in the tool, not, nor the experience, but God. So today, church, I, I pray, you know, if you are going through some things in your life and you think perhaps these are the tools and experience you need, allow God to shift your perspective. Amen. We, we are drawing to an end, to the end. Now let's move on. In the, in the, in the same verse, after David said in verse 37, he says, um, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of lion, from the paw of bear, will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. You would have think that Saul was convinced. Okay? You have fought so many bees, lions, and bears, and you said that God was with you, all this thing. And Saul began to speak in David's language as well. Go, may the Lord be with you. All right now but the interesting happened right after that okay now in verse 38 after he said go and may the lord be with you so saul clothed david with his armor and he put a bronze helmet on his head he also clothed him with a coat of mail interestingly right after saul said to david go and 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 the lord be with you he still wants to put his earthly method to David to fight Goliath. I don't know about you, it reminds me of something. You know, sometimes as leaders in church or life group leader, we always say, Hey, Arthur, God will bless you. That's it, hey, by the way, I think you should do this. Huh? No, no, no. It, it kind of totally invalidates whatever we just said, right? It's, it's like, okay, let's trust God, you know, pray together. But you know what? You know, these are the worldly methods you must, use, you, you must use. This was exactly what Saul was doing. It's interesting. He did. He clothed him with his armor. The king was determined to omit no earthly means of securing victory to his young champions. And David fastened his sword to his armor, tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with this, for I have not tested them. When I read this, I couldn't continue reading the passage anymore. Because growing up in Sunday school, um, the, the, my Sunday school teacher always said, yeah, because the Saul's shirt was too big, so we cannot walk. I mean, it is too big. Okay, that's one of the reasons. But the reason that David did not chose it was because he had not tested them. David was a man of consistency and discipline. He has consistently experienced God while and experiencing the hand of God protecting him. But he has not tested Saul's armor, and therefore he did not use it. Church, and this speaks so much to us about our spiritual discipline. We, you, you, we, we cannot just, we, we need to pray, read the Bible, study the Bible every day of our life, just like David tending his ship every day. You cannot expect, I, I never read the Bible, of God, and then suddenly I, 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 I met with a crisis in my life, and, and I began to blame God. God, why are you not here with me? I'm praying now, I'm reading the Bible, but God, why no verses? But because you have not been reading the Word of God. And how is Holy Spirit going to remind you the Word of God if you don't have it from the first place? Amen? Can I encourage you? We don't have to wait for 2024 to start. Right immediately. Pray. Pray every day. Read the Bible every day. Experience God in your life every day. You know, when David was outfitted with, with Saul's armor, it symbolizes the notion that one should not engage in battle wearing someone else's armor. We always do that, isn't it? Hey, this is the way you should do. Hey, you should be like this. Maybe you should be like this guy who's successful. Do that, and then you will success. We always want to be successful by wearing somebody else's armor. But God is just, but this story is just telling us, hey, you don't need to fight with another person's armor. Be yourself. Everyone else is taken. That was said by Oscar Wilde. Be yourself. Everyone else is taken. I think there's a quote on that. Um, 
You know, you, 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 you don't have to be like somebody else just to, just to get that. Amen? We, 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 you just have to be yourself. I like what Pastor said last week. Come as you are. You know, in this story, David was being himself, his authentic self, the young shepherd boy, and he came. And he came to Saul and he went on to fight Goliath. David rejected the armor for two reasons. He cannot be himself in his armor. Because that's not him. The, his essence will lose if he were to put on Saul's armor. This was not a rejection of Saul's kindness, but an affirmation of his own identity. Because he knows for sure 100% of who he is in God. Amen. And in 1 Samuel 17, 40, as we draw to a close, can I get the team to come up? Then David took his staff in his hand and he chose himself five smooth stones from the book and he put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had and his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistines. So at the end of the day, David chose what he was consistently using every day what was his routine every day. And you know what? And that's the beauty. I, I love it how this story turned out because God eventually used that simple thing in life, the simplest thing that David has been using, practicing day in and day out. And God took that to defeat Goliath. Church, as we, as we build our spiritual routine, our spiritual discipline, Never, never underestimate that. Because God will use all that to defeat the giants in our life. God will use all that to defeat giants in our life. I, I cannot overemphasize this. Perhaps today you are longing for someone's armor. Maybe if you are in David's position, you will be like, Yes, Saul, give me the armor. I have not tested a king's armor before. Would have been nice maybe you have fought so many battles in them. Today if you have been craving for someone else's armor, maybe don't do that. There's only one you and God created you to be you. God never created Kenneth to be someone else. God never created Chris to be someone else. And all our stories are unique and all our lives are precious in God's sight. God just wants you to come as you are, be authentic to yourself and say, God, here I am. This is me. This is my weakness. This is my strength. Whatever it is that I'm proud of, whatever it is I'm so happy of, God, today would you just take all of me, mold me, shape me, use it for your glory. Use it for your glory. So in conclusion, the world always painted the battle of David versus Goliath as a victory for the weak against the strong. But David's not weak. He's not weak. But the true essence of this story is the victory of the prepared David and the victory over his trust and his faith in God against Goliath. If David versus Goliath is just the weak and the strong, and the weak will always win, then we will always be weak forever. We don't need to be strong. The world is painting this picture. It's the David versus Goliath, where the weak always wins. God helps the weak. No, 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 no. It's not true. David was prepared. He was prepared, not just in his daily experience, but he experienced God daily. And that was the preparedness that totally set him apart from all the army of the Israel. And after 40 days of paralysis, I'm so glad the Bible ends with this in verse 40. And he drew near to the Philistine. David was the one who took the initiative, who took the first step to approach Goliath. It wasn't the other way around. The Bible said, and David drew near to the Philistine. He was ready. He was ready, not with armor and sword, 
but by faith and in the authenticity of who he is in God. He was set not by the standards of the world, but by the guidance and the empowerment of God. And when he faced his giant, it was not just a confrontation of a physical might, but a testament to a mightier power of God within him. So today, are you ready, set, and slay your giant? Not with your own experience. Our giants, whatever form they may take, sometimes our giants come in the form of crisis, sometimes our giants come in the form of an enemy that we don't like. Our giants, whatever form they may take, are not the end of our story, but the beginning of God's glory. If you just allow Him to come into your life and showcase of glory, and just say, God, this is me. Do whatever you need. And I pray. You know, that's, if there's only one thing I pray every day, is this, God, every day of my life, let it be a platform to showcase only your glory, nothing else. But the problem with us is sometimes we want to rob God's glory. Hey, no, it's not God, it's me. I want to show you one illustration before we end. I grew up wanted to be a teacher, but I was never qualified to be one. So I thought maybe I'll be a science teacher every time I preach. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So our life is like that sometimes. This is us, a glass of water. You, you can't drink, it's a tap water. Our water is probably, probably not that clean. This is us, our life. And the egg is the giants that come in our life. A lot of time, when the giant came into our life, what happened? It sank. Correct? It just totally overwhelms us, paralyzes us in fear, not doing anything. We accept defeat. Okay, la, this is my condition. I'm just going to accept it. Nothing else to do. But you know what? We are called to be what? The salt. The beautiful thing about salt, we have to be a salt. And what? We have to keep stirring it. It's a, it's a daily thing. It's a consistent discipline that we have to do day in, day out. Stirring it. Because when the real giant come, it will not signal. It will not defeat us. It will just stay at the surface because, it will, we will, because with the faith in Christ, whatever the fear, the enemy is trying to paralyze us, it will not get to the bottom, to the core of our heart. But we with the faith in Christ and obedience to the word of God, we can dispel everything. Amen? So today, I just want to ask you this question. Are you ready to get on a new perspective? Are you set, not by worldly standard, by the standard of God, His holiness and obedience to Him? And only through that, when we kill the giant, when we slay the giant, the credit is not for us, but the credit is all glory to God. Because then people will say, hey Greg, impossible, you can, yeah, it's impossible for me to do that. Definitely no way. Oh, after how you, how you turn around the business, no way. That, with my ability, no way. It's God. It's God. How can you forgive this person who treated, I can't. But it's God. We continue to be the salt of the earth. And that's how we did that. So church, can we to, today all stand up? And as we worship with this song, I want you to just ask God, God, is there a perspective shift that I need in my life today? Oh God, do I, have I been fighting the wrong battles in my life? I need to fight the right battle. I need to find the cause so that I can fight the right battle. 
Or is it that I need to go back to just go? I want to just prepare myself day in, day out to just wait on you, to just commune with you. Why don't we just worship with this song from the top and then allow God to speak to us? Oh, be my anthem. Lord, when the world has fallen and quiet, you stand beside me. Give me a song. 